Well, thanks for that uh, great intro, Leonard. It's good to be here, good to be back in Madison. Uh, as he mentioned, I've been an engineer for, uh, for 20 some odd years now. Uh, how I landed in marketing, boy. <laughs> I guess that's a, that's a long story and you can ask me about it afterwards. But um, as he mentioned, I am now with the Telos Alliance. Uh, the Telos Alliance uh, has six brands now. There are five up there, Telos, Omnia, 25.7, Axia, and, uh, and Linear Acoustic for the uh, television audio processing. But uh, this morning, what I'm going to talk about is using Livewire Plus and AES67 to build complete facilities over IP. And uh, boy, we couldn't have a better, uh, a better theme for this conference. It's um, don't stop thinking about tomorrow is a great theme for, uh, for Livewire Plus and for uh, AES67 because the whole world is going IP. And uh, that includes uh, you, that includes our industry. So let's talk about Livewire a little bit. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the technology? Uh, quite a few of you. Good, good. Well, Livewire has actually been around for for quite a while now. Oh, probably about 12 years. It was uh, the first technology, the first audio over IP technology geared specifically for broadcast environment. Well, fast forward a number of years here. Um, many of you are also familiar with uh, the AES and the AES standards process. We've got a new standard that uh, came out oh, a couple of years ago, AES 67. Okay, so where are we now? Combine the two and uh, the TELUS Alliance has uh, introduced AES67 and Livewire Plus. Uh, Livewire plus AES67 plus whatever else might be uh, coming along. And I'm gonna try, I'm not gonna make this, uh, this commercial. As an engineer, it's always annoying when a vendor gets up and, uh, and gives a 45 minute commercial. By the way, they gave me 45 minutes. <laughs> 45 minutes for a marketing guy with a captive audience? Wow. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit more about Livewire and some of the features of Livewire that, uh, that make it fit into a broadcast environment. Obviously, I mentioned audio over IP. Um, it supports live network streams uh, using 250 microsecond packets for a less than one millisecond network latency. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with IP technology uh, at some extent? Okay, good, a, a good number of you. Um, so you know that the, uh, the larger packets will result in less latency. It also results in more network bandwidth overhead. But uh, again, I'm gonna try and keep this at a higher level. I'm not gonna delve into the really deep technical details here. Uh, Livewire also supports standard streams, which are four millisecond packets at 15 to 40 milliseconds of network latency. Uh, uses standard IP multicasting technology. That's an industry standard. Uh, you can look at multicast audio or video streams with any media player out there, assuming that the media player supports the format and Livewire is just standard 24-bit, 48 kilohertz audio. So you can, yeah, you can look at it on a network with just about anything. Uh, it supports discovery and advertising of sources on the network. And that's important because if you've got all this traffic on the network, what good is it if you don't have a way to find it? I mean, otherwise you'd have to look it up on a list, you know, on a paper, kind of like the old paper wire list and punch lists that, uh, that we're all familiar with. Uh, Livewire supports discovery and advertising of sources so you know what's actually out there and available on the network. Ah, here's an important one. You've got to control things on the network. It supports GPIO. Um, you're always going to have a need for controlling those devices on the network, turning uh, mic lights on and off, starting and stopping CD players, various other device, uh, devices on the network. It supports LWRP and LWCP routing and control protocols. Again, what good is a system without some means of controlling it? And these are both mechanisms for controlling a live wire network. Uh, it supports metering of the audio on the network. It supports remote control of the various resources on the network, and it provides for, uh, for web GUI-based management. All right, so how does AES67 fit into this? Most of you have probably heard about AES67 by now. It's a new standard, 
and it actually, it actually has been ratified as a standard by AES for audio over IP. That's great. We all like standards, right? We want our stuff to talk to other stuff, regardless of whose stuff it is. Okay, so like LiveWire, AES 67 is an audio over IP standard. It has interoperable streams with uh, moderate latency at uh, one millisecond packets and less than six milliseconds network latency. Lower and higher network uh, latency streams are possible, but optional. So many of you probably know that in a live environment when you've got like a microphone going to headphones, latency is the enemy. You want to keep the latency as low as possible. So it's good to be flexible in that regard. But other sources, it doesn't necessarily matter. So there's some flexibility there, just like with LiveWire. It supports both multicast and unicast. And this is important because a lot of networks don't support multicast traffic. Uh, if you've got like a, uh, a wide area network, for instance, that's not set up to route multicast across the entire network. A lot of video networks, microwave networks that have been set up specifically for the purpose are already doing this, but some networks aren't. So it's good to be able to support multicast and unicast. It supports, uh, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with voice over IP? Okay, a good number of you. Well, AES 67, uh, that term should seem familiar, SIP. It uses the same protocol, SIP for uh, connection management on a network. In other words, setting up a connection between various resources. Ah, now, what doesn't it support? It doesn't have a mechanism in and of itself for supporting GPIO and contact closures. There's no really defined mechanism for controlling. I mean, SIP will establish and, and break down connections, but there's otherwise no comprehensive mechanism for routing control protocols. There isn't any internal mechanism for metering or for remote control. And there's no kind of centralized web GUI. The device may have it, you know, it may have some web GUI, but there's no way of consolidating all of that per se built into the protocol. So what's the value of a standard that doesn't include some of those critical features? Well, there is a value there. First of all, it is an industry standard. It allows for vendor interoperation. It enables convergence of studio audio, broadcast, telecom, and intercom systems. I mentioned voice over IP, audio over IP. Many of you use intercoms in like a television plant, for instance. That can all be uh, consolidated into this technology as well. And it's the foundation of future evolution of professional audio systems. Again, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. We think this is really the direction that the industry is, uh, is headed. Standards are a good thing. All right, so back to LiveWire. Okay, it provides all of that. Now, what's the one thing that LiveWire doesn't, or didn't currently, you know, didn't provide at the time? Aha, LiveWire Plus. AES 67 standard streams are now part of LiveWire. So, what's this mean? We've got some protocols up there, including LiveWire, Ravenna, Dante. Okay, great. They all have various levels of capability, but they're kind of up against a wall. They're, they're really not necessarily designed to be extensible and incorporate changes that might come forward in the future. What we've done with LiveWire Plus and AES67 is kind of put a path to the future. So anything that comes along in the future, our intention is to continue integrating that, and we want our stuff to work with your stuff. That's the whole idea. Now, you talked about building, the, building studios with uh, LiveWare Plus and AES67. So I'm gonna go into a case study here. And this one is uh, kind of close to me because I, uh, as you mentioned, I was working for Wyoming Public Media before coming here to Telos. And uh, this was one of the uh, projects that I did for them. A Little bit about Wyoming Public Media. Uh, their studios consist of one primary control room, four production style rooms, uh, multiple ISDN and IP audio codecs, a uh, 24 channel satellite downlink for receiving uh, syndicated programming from National Public Radio and other providers, uh, a KU satellite uplink, a multi channel KU satellite uplink for getting their audio around the state to their network stations, and a microwave STL for feeding their local transmitters. Uh, the broadcast network around the state consists of three audio services, uh, a main channel, a jazz channel, and a classical channel. 
uh, 22 call lettered full service stations, eight translators, uh, web streams for each of those services at multiple bit rates. So the previous infrastructure there, it was, it was fairly old. It was 15 plus years old, uh, entirely analog. It was built for only one program stream. So when you added a second, let alone a third program stream to that infrastructure, you can imagine the nightmare of audio routing that that created with all of that analog equipment. It was not well documented. How many of you ever walked into a plant and found documentation that is either incomplete or non-existent? 66 blocks everywhere, no documentation, or very little or very old documentation. It's, it's an engineer's worst nightmare. And yeah, you can kind of trace it out. You can kind of figure out what's going where, assuming that things at least tell you where the wire on the other end goes. But anyway, changes were extremely difficult. And there were a number of increasing, uh, there was in increasing downtime and, and maintenance costs. Uh, how many of you know about the shadow switches in some of these audio consoles that if you don't use them, they start to fail? <laughs> so, and there was an old analog audio router there that was uh, failing and becoming unreliable as well. So here's their main control room, the before picture of their main control room. Anybody recognize that console? PRNE Radio Mixer 20, great console for its day, still a great console today. Uh, I mean, I know there are stations out there still, still running some of these consoles. Uh, and if well maintained, they, you know, they just kind of sit there and run. But this one, um, this one was starting to suffer some intermittence and it was, it was time to move on. Are those DAT decks on the left? Yes, they are. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Public radio stations, at least they used to. All right. So that was the problem in the main control room. Oh, here's the production room. And we recognize that. Yeah, an old Rockwell Collins IC10A. Now, as I mentioned, they had a number of ISDN and IP codecs, and they were trying to do remotes and do, uh, you know, phoners and various other things. Pretty active, you know, an increasingly active newsroom. And imagine trying to do that on a console that was not designed with even one mix minus bus in the first place let alone <laughs> multiple. And yeah, there are workarounds that you can put in place for that, but it really got to be an untenable situation in a real hurry. Okay, so here's their, here's the core that they had before. Um, you can see the, uh, there's a Leech uh, 32 by 32 audio router there. Uh, there's the control panel, there's the routing frame. That was pretty much what was driving the entire facility and routing all of the audio around the facility between these various analog studios and these various program paths. And um, it was really starting to get flaky. Automation would send it a command and it just would refuse to respond. So, and along with that, they had a, a bay full of Leech uh, analog distribution amplifiers, also slowly starting to fail. So, aha, remember what I mentioned earlier? Imagine a whole facility full of that. <laughs> 66 blocks everywhere, not documented very well. It, it, was, it was getting to be pretty untenable. All right, so that was then. Let's talk about where, where they are now and where they've gone. They started out by investing in a, in a single Axia element control surface and the associated hardware for the main control room. Uh, and that consisted of the control surface, a mix engine, um, a GPIO power supply, and a couple of audio nodes to get some auxiliary audio in and out of the system. And this was just kind of to do some experimenting. Well, actually, prior to that, they had just bought a couple of nodes just to kind of experiment with the technology and see, you know, see what it could do for them. So the cost after they bought the control surface at the time was about 15000 And this was um, a couple of years later, after they'd kind of started doing that, um, Axia introduced a lower cost surface option uh, for around 6K. That was a little eight fader surface with, a, uh, with an included uh, audio engine. And uh, that was ideal for the smaller production room. So when they introduced that at the time as their, uh, as their chief engineer, I said, oh, I'll take four of them. <laughs> that takes care of the production rooms so uh, and we put the element in the, uh, in the main control room. So it actually worked out really well. Uh, kind of on a side note here, the general manager of the station at the time, as I was showing him the technology, um, he looked at it and he went, 
hmm, okay, well, for the cost and all of the benefits, if you look at any one of those benefits, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if you take the whole package and look at what it does on the whole and what it could do in our facility, then it really does start to make sense. So the general manager was on board, and that was, that was important, getting buy-in from the general manager on this project. So once this, uh, this lower cost option came out, um, it was, let's go, you know, let's keep going with this project. It was a modular approach. The system grew out over several years so they could spread the cost of the project out. And that's important, too, because I know budgets at a lot of stations are crunched, even more so today uh, than they had been in the past. And it's scalable to support additional program streams and sources. Need more program streams or sources, just add another node, add another surface, and uh, there you go. Easier to maintain and configure, and just a lower overall total cost of ownership. And we were able to demonstrate this, actually. Um, I kept track of the, the maintenance records on the analog plant before it was transitioned into this, uh, uh, this AOIP plant. And the, uh, the cost to maintain it did, and just the labor overall, did plunge pretty significantly. OK, so here's the after picture. A lot nicer. Um, the DAT decks are gone, of course. <laughs> You can see the, uh, in the middle there, um, that's an element uh, surface. This picture is a little bit, uh, a little bit older, so the studio has changed even more since, uh, since then. And then over on the right-hand side, we've got uh, an LCD with uh, pretty comprehensive metering for the console, just a status display, so it gives them kind of a heads-up display. Yes, there are operators that actually do still look at meters. So. And here's one of the production rooms after. So all four of the production rooms got a uh, similar setup here. Um, we have the, uh, the Axio Radius console. Here's the, uh, the core, which is a power supply. It has some audio I.O. just above those two CD players there. Um, so kind of a nice little all-in-one drop-in console replacement for those rooms. And it just plugged straight into the network, and suddenly everything that was on the network was available in these studios. Once the operators started getting used to dialing up these sources in the studios, once they got used to the idea of any source, any fader, any studio, any purpose, it, it kind of blew their minds. It took a little while for them to get used to that. Okay, so as part of the whole project, they also built out a new tech center here. Uh, one of the other things that AOIP allowed them to do was consolidate uh, a lot of gear and just connect to the studios via, via IP. I mean, they could have left it spread out around the studios, but it really didn't make sense. They didn't really have a consolidated tech core um, but again, that's one of the cool things is that you can, you can architect the system any way you want. Ah, here's one of the features that I really kind of liked. Gave them the ability to see all of their audio paths at a glance just on a heads-up display there. So that's something that's uh, it's pretty valuable if you've got a very active plant, got a number of stations and a number of sources coming in and going out. Yeah, in this case, there are still punch blocks, but they serve a completely different purpose now. They're much more organized. Uh, we moved from 66 blocks to chrono blocks and uh, all documented. Now, instead of carrying analog audio or AES audio or DC, who can guess what most of these blocks now carry? Take a wild guess. Close. Ethernet connections. So, uh, chrono blocks. Multi-pair Cat 5e cable run between the studios. Um, suddenly, with four pairs, you've got uh, your entire facility and all the audio that's on your network available anywhere around your plant. Okay, so here's kind of another example of what they what they did. These are a couple of audio nodes. Uh, these, in particular, are eight by eight. Uh, now we have the uh, X nodes, which are half that size and do four by four each, but um, this, allowed, this was their satellite rack. It allowed them to uh, take a whole bunch of satellite, all those satellite receivers, the satellite uplink and downlink that I mentioned, uh, and consolidate them onto the, uh, onto the AOIP network. Now, these satellite receivers uh, are for the public radio satellite system. They should look very familiar to some of you in commercial radio as well, because they're basically the same receiver. Um, four channel receivers from international data casting with a live wire connection, so that allowed them to put those directly on the, uh, on the AOIP network, along with the GPIO and contact closure. So now instead of having 
four, you know, uh, four audio channels from each of those receivers plus all the GPIO. Now you've just got one Ethernet connection from that receiver carrying your audio and your GPIO onto your network to anywhere in your plant. So benefits, any source, anywhere, they can now do any show or any operational function in any of their studios. It's a distributed system. There's no single central router and it can be more easily designed to minimize single points of failure. Since it's based on standard networking architecture, the sky's the limit. I mean, this is not, uh, IP networking technology is, is mature. You can build an IP network any way you want. Uh, there are a bunch of right ways and there are a bunch of wrong ways to do it, but uh, we won't get into the details of that here. But you can build it as robust as well as the budget will allow. Uh, it's easier to configure and manage. It allows for, and this is a big one. Chris Tarr can kind of attest to this. I know he's in the room. He's done this several times and I've seen his posts on, on Facebook where he'll dial into his Axia systems remotely and change something or a host in the morning goes, oh, I need this or this or this. I forgot about this, this, and this. Oh, okay, click, 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 done. Try doing that with 66 blocks and a punch tool from your house. <laughs> Not gonna happen. So, no more mix minus issues. That was definitely a big one. Need a, need a mix minus, just define it when you're setting up the source. The system will handle it uh, automatically for as many as you need. And they were still able to integrate other manufacturers' equipment into the system, such as codecs, satellite receivers, et cetera. And now with the AES-67 uh, capabilities that have been added in LiveWire Plus, uh, that opens it up even further. So there may be another third-party device on, that you can put on your network that you won't need to hit with, you know, you won't need to go through a node. Finally, less regular maintenance required. There were no more mechanical failing switches in consoles. The consoles, as I'm sure you, you guys know, if you're familiar with audio over IP, they don't carry any audio. It's all just data. The console is a giant control surface. Think of it as a giant keyboard and mouse. Now, no system is without growing pains. And since this was a transition that happened over time, it had a few growing pains. Nothing insurmountable, no real showstoppers. They were on the air through this whole transition that spanned over, over the course of about five years and um, no major outages as a result of the transition. But here's the thing. In their facility, they're on a university campus and um, they had a, uh, a networking infrastructure that was a little bit different multiple VLANs, multiple types of traffic flying around their facility. They could have just as easily, and this is the way it started, they could have you know, used a dedicated switch for their audio over IP network. Okay, that's just fine. But they wanted some interoperability. They wanted to consolidate some of their hardware. Um, it can be done. You can use a consolidated set of networking hardware for multiple purposes, but you have to do it very, very carefully. and. Uh, we have some installations where that's being done, and it's, uh, you know, it does require some very careful planning. But again, back to IP networking. You can build an IP network as robust as the budget will allow. So I think what they ended up with finally at uh, WPR was a monstrous Cisco 4000 series uh, blade core. It's got uh, just a ridiculous amount of capacity in it. But. So there was also some, at the time, there was some third-party hardware that claimed to be natively compatible with the system, but there were some issues. A lot of that has, has since been worked out. And again, with AES-67 now, um, I think we're going to see more and more interoperability. Transitioning from the old plant to the new and existing facility while still keeping everything on the air, I like to compare it to changing the oil in a moving car. It's <laughs> It's going down the freeway at 75 miles an hour. No, it's, it's not an easy process. It requires some very careful planning. But like I said, over this period of five years, they didn't have any major outages that were related to the transition. So that was a good thing. So, summary. LiveWare Plus AES-67 based infrastructure has many operational advantages for facilities of all sizes. I get a lot of people who ask, well, does it still make sense for a small studio, you know, a small facility, one studio, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, I'm rebuilding my studio, do I really need to go with audio over IP? The answer to that, no, you don't need to go with audio over IP. 
But the advantages that it will buy you in the long run are, are worth the investment. The cost of a good, and, and I emphasize good, analog console is comparable to what some of the, uh, uh, the available audio over IP options are now. So whether you've got one studio or whether you've got 100 studios, it's very scalable. Here's another big one. The initial equipment costs can be spread out over several years as the system is expanded, and it allows a migration path from the infra existing infrastructure. Again, it's something that has to be carefully planned, carefully considered, but it is certainly a possibility from a, from a budgetary and a, and a planning standpoint. Lower, lower overall total cost of ownership, particularly when upgrading an older analog facility. Maybe you've got equipment that's you know, reaching that 15, 20 year lifespan and uh, starting to fail. So it might be worth looking at some upgrades. And there are a variety of equipment options available. I mentioned two that, uh, uh, that Axia offers, the Element console and the Radius console. Slightly different approaches to building it out, um, slightly different approaches to building your switching infrastructure. Talk to us. We can, we can help you plan a system. All right, well, I, wow, I'm at 45 seconds. We actually wrapped up on time here. So thank you all very much.